Okay, ladies and gentlemen, if you would, please take your seats, and we'll begin this afternoon's second panel. Check, Good check. afternoon. So we have the slot after lunch, which means that the special challenge to this panel is to keep you awake. And it's the dream team, so I know they can do that. Did you hear that, panel? Uh, so your test question is, what does Boko Haram mean? And we're not going to, you're going to have to, each one of you is going to have to write down right now what you, th what you think Boko Haram means. At the end, we're going to figure out who, who gets the prize. Can I answer? Uh, what? No, <laughs> you may not. Uh, anyway, thank you to AUSA and to PKSOI. Um, I look forward to this event every year. There's fewer and fewer times when the stability operations community uh, can really get together. Maybe we're the CVE community now, but, uh, but truly uh, you have uh, brought together a stellar group of people, and I, and I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I, during the time that I was at USAID trying to knit together USAID and the, and the military, um, I saw the collaboration um, between AFRICOM and, in particular, USA, but also the State Department uh, and the Department of Defense um, firsthand. And, you know, it was first driven by General Ham. He gave USAID uh, a, a strategic planner to try to work uh, on helping us to, to truly knit together our operations. Um, but then it continued under General Rod, um, who really worked uh, in, and walked, walked in lockstep. Uh, with USAID, both on Boko Haram and on Ebola and on countless other problems that we had across the continent. Uh, the welcome mat was always out in Stuttgart. He afforded uh, the, our senior development advisor uh, complete access to the senior leadership at AFRICOM. Um, and then he uh, created this innovation called the Africa Strategic Dialogue, um, along with, with Ambassador Phil Carter and others. Um, and I used to go and travel around to the combatant commands about once a quarter every single one of them. And I would say, do you know what this Africa Strategic Dialogue is? Because you guys should be doing this. It, it, was, it was still going on, I'm, I'm happy to hear. Um, but it was a, a, it's a table, you know? And the table brought together really senior leaders uh, from all across the agencies to, to close the doors and to talk some real talk um, about what we were gonna do on, collectively on problems in the African continent. So hats off to AFRICOM. Um, I, I couldn't, I couldn't um, thank the leadership uh, enough for really truly trying to be an interagency command. So I was so taken with what I saw there that I spent the last year uh, leading a team of researchers trying to produce some reports to record our lessons um, about what we did uh, collectively, and not just what we did, but how we did it in a few different environments. Um, and I, I just want to do a little commercial, but uh, this report, uh, Breaking Boko Haram and Ramping Up Recovery, uh, takes a really hard look um, at, at what the, principally the 3Ds did. It was an unclassified study, so we couldn't include the, uh, the intelligence community. Um, and, and really, the, the, the intent here was not to, not to you know, write my words down here, but was to write your words. I mean, to really talk to the people that were involved and tell the story of the people uh, on the ground that were dealing with this problem of Boko Haram. So we hope it's a, a small contribution uh, to ongoing efforts because we know that the military is really good at harvesting lessons. Civilians are, are not only not resourced to do so, but it's just not part of the culture. Uh, so we hope that some of the lessons in here will help uh, current and future operators. So uh, my commercial is over, um, and I am going to turn it over to the panel, and I know they're going to keep you awake. Um, and General Rod, if I, if I may, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you. So over to you. Oh, okay, thank you. Hey, uh, before we start, what, what am I allowed to say? Anything. Is this like... Well, I don't know. If you say anything, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? I know you can't say classified things, but is this like... No non-disclosure, oh, non-attribution, non non or not. I'd like to understand that before I start. It's not. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. All right. Well, good afternoon. That's all I'd like to say at this point. All right, we started off with a laugh, okay? We're good. All right. 
Okay, well, we'll talk a little bit about Boko Haram and what was going on in really the whole Lake Chad Basin region. And uh, you can read this wonderful uh, work here, and i would probably say some of the things that are in there and duplicate that. But uh, obviously Boko Haram, you know, was uh, a long time, um, you know, organization which, which has really started out with, uh, we used to say, AKs and, uh, and sandals and everything. And they were really a bunch of thugs and just really... Um, robbers, you know, thugs, that's about what they were, but uh, <clears throat> played by the Nigerian government at the time, they built them into what they became, which was the number one killing terrorist organization in the world uh, for a couple of years uh, because of uh, poor management, not taking care of the people and all the things that in the last uh, session I was in, they said are really the root causes of uh, terrorism and the problem. So uh, they had uh, those issues. Uh, of course, everybody knows the history of Nigeria and the three sections and the Christians and the Muslims, and so I won't go through all that. But the bottom line, they grew up and got uh, more powerful over time and uh, in the Northeast, uh, really stationed and, cent and centered around Maduguri. And they got stronger and really became rich by ripping off the banks for their money, the military and the police for their arms. And for a good while there, they were much better fighters and much more organized than the Nigerian army. Uh, and then uh, they started overspilling to the uh, other three countries uh, that we'll talk about a little bit, which are, uh, of course, Chad, Cameroon, and Niger. And, uh, the United States, joined mainly by the French and the Brits, tried to figure out a way to reduce the strength of uh, Boko Haram so that it wouldn't, uh, you know, continue to tear up the largest economy in in Africa. And uh, to do that, uh, we worked very hard with the not only the interagency but also the international community because uh, a lot of players in. Um, in Nigeria, of course, the, the French and the Brits, and when I say Nigeria, I mean all four of those nations. Um, but also the uh, European Union was a, a big part of the, uh, the mix there, and the UN, uh, as, uh, as you can imagine. But uh, there were all the challenges that a country has that has terrorism that grows that big with the political challenges, corruption, you know. and. When I was uh, talking to President Debbie, who uh, was at that point pretty critical of the Nigerian thing, I, I asked him, I said, well, how, how does this work, uh, President? I don't understand how the richest country in Africa can be begging three of the poorest countries in Africa to take care of it. He had some choice words, which I will not repeat here. <laughs> but uh, that's about where we were. And then, fortunately, we had some great people come on, like Ambassador Mazina here. And uh, when you talk about uh, uh, trying to do this, uh, the first thing I think we ought to understand is it's a, it was regional. It wasn't just in Nigeria. So uh, Ambassador Mazzino came on as the, uh, the regional rep there and really brought together the four country teams to bring them together. And, and uh, you know, he is a very, very inclusive guy. So we were included in all those efforts to make sure that we were fully aligned with uh, the State Department. Um, so for us, uh, we looked, uh, in addition to the coordination, as I talked about, with uh, the four host nations, the French, the Brits, the European Union specifically, uh, we looked at the ways that we could make a difference. And for, uh, for us at that point in time, we had really four ways to make a difference. Uh, that's the theater security cooperation and capacity building efforts. Uh, engagements, exercises, and operations. And uh, for, I think, yes, we used every bit of all four of those ways to try to help support the efforts of all four nations. The hardest one to help being Nigeria, because this, in the ambassador's words, they made it hard for us to help them. <laughs> and that was their way. So that, uh, we, so we really, we were working uh, mainly with the three nations on the outside and, uh, and trying to get something started with the Nigerians, uh, which was, of course, the root cause of the problem uh, for, uh, for Boko Haram. Um, 
and then the capacity building efforts, uh, when we talk about those, you just got to understand that uh, during that time uh, in Cameroon, it was the unit w that we'd been working for a, with a long time uh, that was uh, doing the, the major effort in it. In, uh, Chad, same way, same unit that we'd been working with for years that was doing most of the work. And in uh, Niger, while it wasn't the, um, uh, the same unit because we hadn't worked that much with Niger over the years as we had in Cameroon, Chad, but uh, the, um, the person that led the unit was a uh, Army War College graduate. <laughs> Okay, so those those are the relationships and the and the capacity building over time that was uh, working there. And while we had some relationships with some of the Nigerians, and we had some great relationships with the Special Boat Service, who actually had to, had to come down from our, up from the uh, uh, from the um, from the water there in the south to come up and work in the Lake Chad, which was pretty good. But um, uh, and then so those the state. The capacity building efforts were long term. They'd been there and they were the units uh, and the organizations that were doing the majority of work from uh, the outside, from both Cameroon and Chad. And like I said, we had a commander over in uh, Diffa in Niger who was a, a war college graduate. And then the engagements, uh, the engagements, we worked with all the international partners as well as uh, those four nations. We did multiple trips down there with every level uh, trying to work with them. When the Shabak girls were. Uh, uh, were taken, we put up an interdisciplinary team inside the embassy and the country team in Nigeria that was um, uh, led by the ambassador. So we filled that out with uh, all the interagency players, much more than the three Ds. And a uh, big deal is um, uh, uh, putting that in there. The ambassador controlled it, and then we all kept our tentacles and our, and our uh, co coordination and communication inside. Okay, so besides the capacity building and the engagements, I want to talk a little bit about exercises. And one of the major exercises we did during that time was uh, uh, based in Chad, and it was uh, Flintlock, and had all the same players involved. And I also just tell the story of the capacity building efforts. Both the commander of the uh, Cameroonian forces that were fighting and the Cameroonian and the Chadian forces met at a conference in Stuttgart. So it's always good to know who's on your flank and everything, but that's part of the capacity building. Uh, but flintlock and the exercise we do, many of them, uh, the flintlock exercise actually pa uh, was patterned totally after this issue. So not it was a kind of a rehearsal as well as a communications exercise. And then uh, for the operations, uh, the last uh, of the four ways, uh, we had um, a um, coordination and liaison cell right in uh, N'Djamena. And N'Djamena is important because it's a French long-term base there. So that's where the... Brits, the French, and the United States, and later the multinational joint task force that was set up by the, the four nations and the African Union uh, to combat Boko Haram uh, was set up. And the major effort they did really was about intelligence sharing, which is a, a big part of the, uh, the operational effort uh, that we uh, supported with everybody. And you know that uh, during that time, uh, uh, we also uh, flew intelligence surveillance reconnaissance uh, mainly out of N'Djamena and later in uh, Cameroon when we set up uh, some support there, as well as building the capacity of uh, two of the units who we were working with to have some uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities. So all that was uh, uh, moving in the right direction. And then um, uh, the multinational joint task force, which was set up in the, the Lake uh, Chad Basin Commission where it first started, and I, uh, I tell the story all the time to just to make sure you know where we came from. I, I think I was the second American that went in the Lake Chad Basin Commission headquarters. The first one American was the security team who went in the day before to make sure I could live, and there was one officer in there, one military officer. That was the uh, multinational joint task force for several months. <laughs> Uh, but they finally got uh, gone, and we helped them with uh, support, like communication support, set up a network so they could communicate with all four countries and, uh, and help there, as well as the intelligence sharing, which is a long, drawn-out process to get all the approvals uh, in the interagency to, to do that. And then, um, and then with that multinational joint task force, one of the things that's hard 
and uh, we talked about a little bit about balance and, and relationships and coordination and communication, but the fight against Boko Haram was um, really run at the strategic level in four places, and that was really the presidential palaces of the four nations, because <laughs> the presidents got personally involved in everything and guiding their nations. Um, then the second one was in the uh, Minister of Defenses and the uh, and the Chiefs of Army or Chiefs of uh, the Joint Chiefs, as in the case of uh, of Nigeria. So we really depended on uh, the country teams to work that piece and to uh, to continue to do the engagements at their level, so they understood what the intent was of all four nations. And as you can imagine, they're not always the same, but uh, uh, they, at least they had one common one in this one, which is uh, the defeat. Boko Haram. And then uh, we had uh, military people at all the command and control locations uh, where the fight was going on in uh, doing exercises and operations and doing advise and assist activities in the headquarters of all of them, with the exception of um, Maduguri, which was the last one we got into, and that was uh, the Nigerian headquarters up there. Uh, because we, we were uh, limited to uh, the capital for a long time. But if you look at that, we had a whole network that was tracking and supporting the headquarters of all the four nations involved at different levels. And like I said, the furthest one away was Nigeria. And then uh, up to the operational and strategic level in the Minister of Defense, the Chiefs of Services, as well as the, uh, the presidents themselves to try to understand what was going on. So that's all I'll uh, talk about this time, and I'll pass it to my <laughs> next colleague. Thank you very much. Oh, there's something very complicated. And I look forward to your questions as long as uh, Ambassador Mazina doesn't ask me anymore. <laughs> I'm worried about those guys in the back, so I have to make eye contact with them. They're going to drift away. Uh, this is a speaker's nightmare come true. I'm following seven stars. This is uh, uh, not an enviable position, but I anticipated this, so I want to share with you a story. And this is a story I have actually never told. And sadly, it's a true story. I've not change the names to, to protect the innocents. There are no innocents in this story. The perpetrators are my older brother, Daryl, and myself. I was about 10 or 11. The victim was Joe Boston. Joe Boston was our hired hand on the 120-acre uh, dairy farm where I was born and raised. We didn't like Joe Boston. So we're in this silo, Daryl and I. A silo is a tall cylindrical structure, and we're about 30 feet up in the air, and we, each of us has our silage fork. We're throwing silage down the chute. And we look down the chute, and what do you see? You see Joe Boston, that little bald head of his, darting in and out of the chute as he's scooping up the silage. My brother looks at me. He says, hey, I'm going to make you a bet. Oh, what's that? He said, I'm going to bet you can't pee on Joe's head. <laughs> well, this is a challenge not to be passed up. So I uh, used the physical, uh, physics calculations of a 10-year-old, timed it, I thought, just right, and uh, let go. And let me just say I won the bet. <laughs> Joe didn't see the humor of this. And Dad uh, was not impressed with my mastery of basic physics. The consequences are best left unspoken. The point I make is that as a kid, I have done a lot of stupid things. But there are limits to stupidness. And there was one thing I never tried to do. Never did I try to herd the 20 to 30 cats, barn cats that we had. Herding cats, no, that's too stupid. I would never try to herd cats. And that has been a central tenet of my life <laughs> for 50 years. Until <laughs> 
February 2015. And that's when I accepted this job to coordinate America's assistance to our Lake Chad uh, Basin partners to help them win the fight against Boko Haram. And I am pleased to say that hurting U.S. government cats uh, is more successful than the four-legged variety. So as senior coordinator of Boko Haram, I coordinate on a multitude of levels. The Africa Bureau, the, the State Department, the Washington Interagency. The interagency defined much more broadly to include uh, AFRICOM, US, EU, uh, all of our posts in Africa. Uh, and, and also, uh, I engage with the P3. So you can see there are many layers uh, of, of this uh, coordination uh, enterprise. And it's all focused on what we've heard already about the three Ds. Uh, I put them in a little bit different order, maybe. Uh, diplomacy, development, and then defense. Amazingly, and I know you're going to be amazing, uh, amazed as well, this actually works. And in my 36 years of, of this business, I have never seen America, the interagency process, uh, come together like this. So try to picture a herd of US government cats in harness. Picture this, US government cats in harness pulling more or less in the same direction. Now that is an image. But it's one that's shown it can be done and is now being emulated. Uh, how this coordination is done, uh, you heard reference to the weekly civets. Uh, we send this invitation out to 200 plus people, I don't know, 50, 60, 70, all over the world uh, participate in this. And it doesn't matter if we have nuclear war or not. Every Wednesday at 8 o'clock in the morning, Washington time, this civics happens. We have an agreed agenda. Everyone contributes. Everyone gets the agenda ahead of time. We go bang, bang, bang through that agenda, reaching out to all of the stations. Then we write up the notes, send out comprehensive notes, and then do it all over again. So that's one uh, element of the coordination. The P3, just this morning, two hours with London and Paris, Ministries of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Defense, and Development Agency in all three capitals. And then we have a special DDR Defections Action Group. And that is doing the obvious. And then, of course, just all the engagement to har uh, harmonize the US government. So the question comes up, why does this actually work? And I think there are some uh, good reasons. And I think it's important that, that we take a look at it. Because I think it works because generally, and I don't want to overstate this, generally the interagency is in agreement on the fundamentals. And we, we heard it. Uh, Coming out of Stuttgart, we heard General Rudd talking about these things. Um, so so uh, here's my listing. One, general agreement that Nigeria, as a deputy commander of AFRICOM, uh, Ambassador Lascaris put it, Nigeria is too big to fail. Yes, it is. And, and imploded Nigeria and imploded West Africa is not in the interest of America's security, America's economic growth and prosperity, our diplomatic objectives, our humanitarian uh, imperatives. This fight matters. The interagency agrees on that. Secondly, and I'm going to repeat this. You heard it from General Rod. You heard it from Stuttgart. By, with, and through. Those are not throwaway words, and they're critically important words. This is not America's war. We are not looking for another war. We don't need another war. By, with, and through. Heard it, uh, we've heard it here, but I just heard it last week uh, when I was over at the National Security Council uh, for a, an interagency meeting. So that's the second area of agreement, by, with, and through. The third area. Our partners cannot bomb their way to victory. 
When I took this job, I had a condition. I said, look, I'm of a certain age. And when I look at a, a, a black, shiny granite wall, only a block from my office, I see 58,000 names, and I see my face reflecting back on me. That's a powerful thing. And it's a lesson of the folly of policy driven largely by filling body bags. It doesn't work. And I say, if you hire me for this job, uh, I will coordinate on the security side. Yes, I will. But also deal with the underlying drivers. And this is an area where the interagency also agrees. The interagency understands that Boko Haram, as General Rogers put it, didn't drop out of the sky. It came out of the soil. And you have to know why. Because if we're going to help our partners win this war strategically, you've got to deal with these underlying drivers. So let's talk about that soil for a minute. Discrimination and neglect from the central government for decades and decades and decades. Failure of state and local governance as well. The civil governance, the traditional leaders, the religious leaders failed in northeast Nigeria. Corruption, I don't need to talk about that. General Rod made reference to it. Lack of investment in the human and physical infrastructure. Female literacy rate, 7%. Give me a break. Uh, security forces abuses. For example, 2009, uh, the, uh, the government decided Boko Haram's a threat. So they, they launched a campaign. They killed seven to 800 Boko Haram followers in a few days, including the leader of Boko Haram. The lack of economic opportunities. And bear in mind, you have one of the highest fertility rates in the world in this area. Poverty. The environment. Lake Chad is about 10% of what it used to be. Global climate change, may, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but also, the, uh, all the water being pulled off by big dams on the two major uh, tributaries to the lake. Well, surprisingly, if you cut off the water, the lake's going to diminish. Religious zeal, definitely part of a global movement. Influx of arms flooding out of Libya. Anyway, I list them off real quickly just to give you a dose. That is the, those are the ingredients of the soil that gave birth to Boko Haram. And the community understands that strategic success depends on dealing with those drivers. So that's, I think that is part of our success. And the last element that I want to link the success of the movement is recognizing that the connection, the affiliation with ISIS uh, going back to March of 2015, that's a game changer. Uh, and it certainly makes the threat real, current, and the threat potential ever more serious uh, and heightens the threat uh, to us. So all of these shared fundamentals created the foundation for a strategy. We have a strategy. That strategy is fully in effect, endorsed by the current administration, responsive to a congressional mandate, briefed to the Hill, briefed to our P3 partners, briefed to our Lake Chad Basin partner countries. We have a strategy. And the goal of that strategy is, and we heard this uh, already, degrade and contain uh, Boko Haram so it's on the pathway to defeat. To uh, achieve that strategy, our objectives are to strengthen our partner's capacity. This is what General Rod did during his tenure, what General uh, Waldhauser is doing right now, helping strengthen capacity is to help our partners develop and implement mechanisms to pull fighters out of the ranks of the enemy through effective DDR and defection policies. It's to weaken Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa by cutting off uh, inputs, money, and uh, fighters, things like that. It's to help our partners fill in behind success on the battlefield. This is so critical. Fill in behind success on the battlefield with civilian security, with effective governance to deliver essential services, water, sanitation, education, health, just the basics, nothing fancy. 
to fill in behind battlefield success with economic policies to kickstart dead economies, no farming, no fishing, no trading, no herding. And also to uh, meet the humanitarian needs of almost two and a half million people uh, who have been displaced, plus millions more suffering food insecurity. So how's it going? Well, all these people here will talk about that. Um, the way I put it is this way. I am really proud that the United States has stepped up to the plate in terms of security partnership. We have stepped up to the plate. Right here sits the guy who played a key role in making that happen. We provide advisors. We provide intel collection capacity. We share intelligence. We provide logistical support. That's a saying fuel. And we supply equipment. I could go into all of those, but other speakers will, or we can do it later. We have stepped up to the plate. And I really appreciate AFRICOM and its constituent elements for that success. I am really proud, I am really proud of what we're doing to address the civilian challenges. Training police, helping rebuild uh, police facilities. We're prepared uh, to help kickstart economies. Uh, Chris, I'm sure, will be talking more about that. And, and working on uh, DDR and defections. I am really proud, I am really proud of what we're doing to support the humanitarian needs of the Lake Chad Basin area. Like I said, uh, two, almost two and a half million people displaced. And I think there'll be, uh, uh, right now, fiscal year last year and so far this year, we're at $640 million. That's a chunk of change. And uh, I'm told there will be more announced uh, in a couple days up in UNGA. Uh, much progress has been made. When I took this job, February 2015, Boko Haram controlled an area the size of the state I live now, Maryland. Some people compare it to Belgium. But they don't control that area anymore. They're much, much reduced. MNJTF was created in February, March of 2015. Cross-border uh, cooperation in ways unimaginable. Even Cameroon and Nigeria working together. This is impressive. Nonetheless, nonetheless, you have these millions of people who cannot go home. You have these millions of people suffering deep, severe food insecurity. Why? Because Boko Haram, because ISIS West Africa continue a campaign of asymmetric attacks with devastating effect. With devastating effect. The government of Nigeria has made progress on the ground, but its failure to hold that ground, it, it, it's become a whack-a-mole kind of thing. It just promises to go on indefinitely. I would even argue at the moment the terrorists might have uh, the upper run, the upper hand on, on the situation. So when I look at the picture overall, I, I compare it to a movie. And in this movie, America, our P3 partners, we are support actors. And, you know, I don't care how many Oscars we might win. I don't care how good General Rodriguez is. We are still support actors. And the quality of this movie, is the movie going to win an Oscar? Are the terrorists going to be defeated? tactically and in a strategic sense. That depends upon the lead actors. That depends upon Nigeria, Niger, Chad, Cameroon. So anyway, we're going to hear uh, a lot more about these challenges. Uh, and I'm going to say, I hope we hear more about the opportunities.
know, coming from the farm, always got to look on, on the bright side uh, because there are opportunities. And I hope that one of the other speakers will talk about something called the Obama Initiative because it is really exciting. I'm guessing many of you uh, might not know about that. Uh, we can talk about it because I think this is the first indication of our partners in the Lake Chad Basin uh, region getting it right in putting these war-ravished communities back together. Not to the way they were, because that was the soil that created this mess, but to something better. So that's my hope. On that, I better leave, or Beth will come up here and throw me off. So see you all later. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Reverend. <laughs> uh, if you couldn't tell, Dan and I go to a lot of meetings together. <laughs> and I have very congruous points to make. Um, uh, but just to have fun, uh, I think I'll now call this the cat's rebuttal. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll play with some of this stuff perhaps from a slightly more skeptical uh, point of view. Maybe that's the difference between Iowa and Ohio um, from whence we come. Uh, when, uh, yeah, it's always a rebuilding year in Cleveland. Um, but so a couple of, of, of things, maybe just one first off uh, the bat. Um, as folks probably know, USAID has an extensive human intelligence network. It's just we choose to deploy it in Washington as opposed to overseas. <laughs> um, so I did hear uh, that um, uh, uh, Sarah Sewell had made a comment earlier about uh, USAID and State Department and that relationship. And I did just want to say one thing um, uh, uh, that, so that folks were aware of that. Uh, we have a legislative branch of government and they appropriate the funds that we use. And uh, every year USAID begs and begs and pleads for more discretionary funding that we can use for what we think is the most important work to do. Uh, but that's not usually how the appropriations bills come out. Uh, and the 2017 bill was no different. In fact, broke a record for us, which is hard to do, because each year it is almost mathematically impossible for us to meet all of the earmarks and directives that we are provided by Congress. Uh, and we broke a record this year with the FY17 appropriation. So I say that because uh, um, issues like governance, uh, issues that we think are the most important things to work on, sometimes we do not necessarily have the resources to do that. So I certainly share uh, Sarah's uh, vigor and desire for us to do better, absolutely, and you'll hear some of that come through um, uh, some of my comments uh, here now. But at the same time, uh, I think uh, we do have to be cognizant that our resources are provided for very specific reasons in the foreign aid budget uh, from Congress. Um, so a couple of things. Um, and don't take it personally, Ambassador. Um, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll say a couple of critical things, and then I swear I'll try to get more optimistic. So one is I do think that we still struggle as a government uh, to get out of our very traditional and comfortable <laughs> silos of excellence and our bilateral lenses to cooperation. I think this is true in development work, uh, it's in true in security work and other things. Yet we are confounded with a essentially and quintessentially regional problem with Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa. So we're still struggling with that, I would argue. Um, I'm not totally comfortable that we've hit the stride we need uh, on regional programming. Uh, on, I think we need more cross-border initiatives. I think we need more cross-border programming. I think we, in times, need more multi-country diplomatic efforts to support that. Uh, and uh, while I am certainly encouraged by the MNJTF, I'd love to see a civilian equivalent, especially in some of these areas like DDR uh, and related uh, subjects like defections and de-radicalization. Um, we're sort of waiting for that, to be honest. Um, that can't be a solution that we sell with PowerPoint slides to Lake Chad Basin countries. That epiphany and that light bulb has to go off for them. 
Uh, if you need any evidence of what it looks like uh, to try to do that from our position, uh, you can review uh, the long history of unsuccessful demarches that we've had with Lake Chad Basin countries trying to uh, get to policies that we thought were more effective, uh, but were not necessarily ones that they internalized. Um, is the Lake Chad Basin a multi-country hotspot? Absolutely. Uh, do the subnational governments have venues to collaborate? That's something that scares me quite a bit. And we just came back from what I think we both share a view was a, a, a very productive, yet at the same time scary, uh, conference on the Lake Chad Basin in Berlin, uh, where it was pretty evident that there is a lot more knowledge management and, and, and knowledge transfer that needs to happen across the subnational level of government in the Lake Chad Basin to really inform governors and others who have a lot of delegated authorities uh, Abuja is a long way away, um, and it certainly is much farther than that in most people's minds, especially if you're in Northeast Nigeria. Um, I also think that it, uh, it, it makes it hard for us as international actors to plug in when we don't necessarily have those clear demand signals from our African counterparts. Uh, and Despite our classic American enthusiasm uh, for not only coming up with the solution, but then marketing and selling it to the intended recipient of the solution, uh, I think that's not going to work. So are our civilian and military efforts congruous and mutually reinforcing? I think yes, certainly conceptually. Um, and I'll unpack that a little bit more in a minute. For this multi-country hotspot, do we have the regional institutions that we need to convene, deconflict, align, and even compel good African efforts and a balanced, soft, and hard security approach? I'd argue no. Do we have some regional institutions in this area of Africa? Yes. Um, I think maybe the Lake Chad Basin Commission has doubled their staff to two. Um, no, I'm joking. That we have some regional institutions, but to be honest, they need a lot of capacity building support. And when we look at our investments, both in foreign assistance and in security assistance, I think sometimes we underutilize or underdevelop some of our African counterparts at the regional institutional level. So do we have a toehold on hard security with the MM and JTF? Yes, I think we do. Could we build on that for that civilian equivalent that I'm talking about? Yeah, I'll stop being a wet blanket now, but I do think that there is a chance to build from that. Uh, the question, the big soul searching question in my mind is do we have the time? How fast is this problem metastasizing and how quickly is the architecture of response across hard and soft sides building its capacity up to be able to counter that metastasizing problem? And that's the thing that I think I am the most concerned about. Um, so it's completely true that despite any level of our sort of enthusiasm, uh, to be decisive in solving this wicked set of intertwined problems, it's going to be the epiphanies and those initiatives from the Africans that gets us to a fully effective, long-term, sustainable solution, and I would argue further down the road towards uh, long-term strategic success. To illustrate this uh, is, uh, uh, well, again, that sort of history of demarches. Um, uh, also of many conferences that have taken place, many visits that have taken place, many high-level uh, meetings that have taken place, uh, and in some cases to, to no real significant effect. As I think uh, um, Ambassador Mozina said, um, we've worked with many people who are extremely skilled at telling us what we would like to hear. And so what are the USG interests as well? I think this is a, a soul-searching question. It was, I think, very useful to hear such a clear statement earlier from AFRICOM about the role that the U.S. has relative to France in some of these areas, especially in the Sahel. That clear statement of the degree to which we are in a lead role or a supporting role, I think sets a cultural tenor that is very, very helpful for us. I think it infuses a degree of humility in the USG system and analysis and our response posture that I think is very important. Um, but again, it sometimes is quite hard to cage our enthusiasm. So are we, are we in support mode? And if so, what does that mean for our posture and our expectations for improvement? Um, there are very few USG strategies that are written that are not messianic uh, and uh, extraordinarily ambitious. 
because if we can will it to be done and we can write an interagency document to do it, then surely it will happen. Um, but I think that this support culture, I think, is very important for us to internalize uh, as we go forward in Lake Chad Basin. So on 3D sort of work, um, if we have any shot at getting the appropriate civil military cocktail, uh, then I certainly believe it will be via an institutional partner on the military side like AFRICOM. Uh, and so paid advertisement uh, at this point, but to be honest, think of almost this counterfactual. How much further behind would we be if we didn't even have the architecture that we've got at present in the USG? We would be fumbling around in kindergarten. So it's pretty amazing for certainly a USAID person to have AFRICOM commanders uh, singing the praises of a 3D balanced approach, seeking desperately to advocate on our behalf when we can't do so ourselves. And certainly, uh, in some cases, asking their entire system, uh, as beautifully staffed as it is, to calm down and wait a minute so that AID and others can catch up and make sure that there's a balanced approach articulated in policy and decision making. So uh, do I still get eyeball rolls when I suggest that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 20 years out planning uh, on issues like family planning and demographics or human rights uh, and democratic election processes uh, are really important? Yeah, I still, I still get the eye rolls sometimes uh, uh, from folks. Uh, and do I distribute eye rolls uh, when uh, we are conveying confidence that the latest security assistance package we've dreamed up is going to be decisive in long-term victory uh, against this threat in Lake Chad Basin? No, I don't believe it. Uh, so a couple of quick things. Um, one other point, and we haven't brought it up, but it's going to come up is uh, our posture on DDR issues and certainly things that we're working on live case right now. That includes legal issues uh, and barriers to our effectiveness. Uh, so in case folks wondered, we are working on that um, pretty intensively to try to make sure that we have clarity with regards to what we can do with what type of resource uh, in what type of a situation in a very atypical reintegration environment. It would be wonderful if we had a formal rule of law process and a completely capable Nigerian or other Lake Chad Basin countries uh, legal system to process, stamp and certify people as having renounced uh, membership and uh, having a third party UN entity that could vouch for that and run them through an intake process. Uh, but we're, we're, not, we're not in that type of a reintegration situation. We're in a very, very messy one. And that puts additional legal strain on our system and our ability to respond that I think we all ought to be sober to. Um, another uh, thing, and I think Beth maybe posed this to us, but defining stabilization is always hard, uh, and that hasn't changed. Uh, and I would say, I know you wanted us to speak for a second to that, but we are still trying to figure out how a lot of these things fit within our interagency structure and our architecture and which entities are the most uh, equipped or capable of responding when and how, at what phase, with what types of resources, intellectual, programmatic, strategic, et cetera. Um, so we do still have more work to do that. I, I argue we still have more work to do on that within USAID, let alone within the interagency. Um, uh, per Ambassador Mozina's request, uh, we certainly are doing plenty of things at the local level, and there are some amazing community efforts that we are carrying out at the very highly localized and specific level. Um, folks familiar with USAID may know that we've deployed now four uh, USAID Office of Transition Initiative teams in the Lake Chad Basin. We have them in Niger, uh, Nigeria. Uh, Cameroon, and we will be starting up before the end of this month our first programmatic activities in Chad. Uh, those are very focused on CVE, and they are very focused on localities that are hotspots where we still think we can shape the environment. Uh, lest anyone thinks that's disconnected from the uh, military side of action, um, uh, it is connected and proud to say that, for example, at our CVE hub in West Africa, which is based in Accra, Ghana, we have an embedded SOCAF person on our team. Um, that still leaves me impatient. Um, uh, and don't worry, I will not work in any bodily fluids into my 
anecdotes or stories here, but the, the fundamental changes needed to stabilize the Lake Chad Basin in the long term are on shaky ground. And the sense of political will that is necessary to really move the dial on those issues is missing right now. I'm not saying it can't show up. Uh, we need it, uh, but we don't have it yet. I do hope I'm wrong, and I'm just projecting my nice linear orderly Washington sort of perspective, and since I'm not from the Lake Chad Basin, you gotta take everything I say certainly with a, a grain of humility. Um, but to best question, what is Boko Haram? I'd argue it's an existential threat to the same old way that these African governments have managed these marginalized areas. It's about governance. And I think uh, the, the humanitarian situations that have happened recently, the ongoing crises that we're seeing in the region, uh, the citizens will remember that. Uh, this will impact the state-citizen uh, relationship. It will change it. Uh, the situation's not gonna change quickly, so you're gonna see the effects of a prolonged humanitarian crisis, which start to become generational, uh, and that is gonna shape the narratives. Uh, there was a quote I wanted to share with you this weekend. I saw a new um, report from UNDP, um, and uh, this will be the height of my wet blanket <laughs> speech, but the study reveals a picture of a frustrated individual, marginalized and neglected over the course of his life, starting in childhood, with few economic prospects or outlets for meaningful civic participation that can bring about change, and little trust in the state to either provide services or respect human rights. The study suggests, and this is based on interviews with 492 uh, former members of Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram, uh, the study suggests such an individual could, upon witnessing or experiencing perceived abuse of power by the state, be tipped over the edge into extremism. One of the statistics uh, from the study was that 71% of recruits interviewed said that it was some form of government action that was the tipping point that triggered their final decision to join an extremist groups, an extremist group. The actions most often cited were government action, including killing or arrest of a family member or friend. So just to make sure we stay sober um, to the fact that not only do we need to act in coordination, but our messages to our African counterparts need to be consistent. They need to be clear. They have to understand what our priorities are. We can't have dueling banjos with regards to what the US government is saying is the most important thing. And then I think we need to be very sober to the long-term realities of what's gonna stabilize the situation in the first place. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm Alexis Smallridge, the Deputy National Intelligence Officer for West Africa at the National Intelligence Council in the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. For those of you who aren't aware, the National Intelligence Council is the body uh, responsible for representing analytic um, communities uh, in the intelligence community in the U.S. government. So I'm here today as the intelligence community representative. I'm also here today as probably the most difficult of Ambassador Mozina's cats, perhaps. Maybe not. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll let him decide. <laughs> But as I follow our distinguished panelists from the rest of the three Ds, I think that I'm probably correctly placed in this lineup as the IC representative last. However, I'm glad that the conference organizers included me and the intelligence community on this panel because I think the intelligence communities in the whole of government response is often forgotten, uh, included at the last minute, or skipped over for reasons of classification or lack of contacts in the intelligence community. And so today, to underline the value and necessity of intelligence community collaboration and contribution to the whole of government effort, I thought I'd walk through the major intersections between the IC and the rest of the U.S. government in the Lake Chad region com uh, conflict. And I will note, I have, been, I have been asked by my NGA colleagues not to call it the Lake Chad Basin uh, because it's apparently a geographically inaccurate term since the Lake Chad Basin is a much, much larger area than just the Lake Chad area that we talk about here. So. Note that for your quiz after this panel. <laughs> 
So I'll start out by talking about the intelligence community contributions to counterterrorism counter efforts on the ground in Africa, and then move outward to talk about the intelligence community's role in Washington uh, in this uh, conflict. For support to U.S. counterterrorism efforts in the region, I, I don't think I really need to underline the value of the, this effort for, for, for the audience here today. Uh, in addition to the obvious support of the intelligence community in identifying CT, car, CT targets, providing context, intel sharing that uh, some of the previous panelists noted, um, there are two areas beyond that that I wanted to highlight. First, the importance of the IC in assisting in counterterrorism efforts on the ground. And second, the ability of the intelligence community to bring creative solutions to bear. In Africa and in many developing countries around the world, the responsible leaders and decision makers in any particular country may not be the obvious ones. And this is not about Nigeria, this is just a theoretical comment. Uh, the chief of defense forces may be only a figurehead, the military intelligence may be an empty shell, real pow power may lie in a small anonymous unit housed in a civilian agency. In, and the intelligence community, I think, can s serve a key role in helping to identify this dynamic for U.S. agencies. Also, in a country like Nigeria, where Nigerian interagency cooperation is limited and the intelligence service often, often operates totally separately from the military on counterterrorism cases, a U.S. interagency approach to counterterrorism efforts is vital. The recent arrest of an ISIS West Africa operative who had planned attacks on multiple uh, Nigerian and Western targets, including in Abuja, in a joint operation between the military and the Department of State Services, which is Nigeria's intelligence component, only underlines the importance of the U.S. encouraging on-the-ground cooperation between the Nigerian and military services. In the Lake Chad region, where every country is, has a fractured and unpredictable bureaucracy, U.S. coordination is key. And this isn't just, of course, Lake Chad. It's all of Africa and many other countries around the world. Additionally, my second point here, the, U the intelligence community is also a source of creative thinking and solutions, and sometimes resources, to some of the intractable problems the U.S. faces in Boko Haram and isis -Wa. It is by partnering, partnering together that we bring the best of U.S. government resources against the urgent threat of Boko Haram and isis -Wa. Now I'll turn to a slightly a more amorphous uh, contribution, and that's the intelligence community's contributions in Washington and to the policy community and policy discussion. This is one that's, I think, option, often not fully captured or understood. Um, in addition to the wide range of written production that the intelli intelligence community distributes, the intelligence community also briefs policymakers in multiple agencies, providing the context for decision makers to understand the Boko Haram and ISIS pro problem. I want to highlight two particular areas here where I think intelligence analysis is most useful to the whole of government effort. First, providing uh, analysis that looks at the bigger picture, and second, flagging when the situation on the ground changes. When analysts provide information to the policy world, it's not just to the operators on the ground, um, our tactical counterparts at the working letter level, but also all the way to the president and other very senior officials who only occasionally focus on Nigeria and the Lake Chad re region. The intelligence community's framing of the problem and in their assessments are sometimes the only look or one of very few looks that these very senior policymakers may have at Nigeria. And thus, this input influences the guidance and strategic direction of the whole U.S. government effort. In addition to informing very senior policy officials, the intelligence community also makes an invaluable contribution by providing stand-back analysis to those officials who are immersed in the tactical day-to-day. In many instances, intelligence analysts are the only ones who have the time and space to sit back and think broadly about the problems that the U.S. and the Nigeria and the region face in the Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa fight. This leads to my next point. Analysts also pay, play a valuable role in flagging when the situation on the ground changes. Sometimes change may be so small or incremental it goes unnoticed, but that change may have an outside effect on U.S. government support and on the regional reaction. Whether it was the evolution of the conflict after the kidnapping of the Chibok schoolgirls in April 2014, the change in the Nigerian government approach after the election of President Buhari in March of 2015, or the ongoing changes and challenges caused by last year's split between Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa, the intelligence community has a role to play in keeping our customers informed of the changes and the need for adjustments in the U.S. government approach. 
Our work here is not done, as the other panelists have uh, very capably highlighted. The evolving ISIS West Africa threat is one area I in particular wanted to emphasize. Uh, I think Ambassador Mozina and uh, Chris also touched on it. Uh, this is an area where we see continuing challenges over the next few years and where it really is an imperative that the U.S. government continue to focus this whole of government uh, effort. Finally, I wanted to end with one point. In addition to bringing a whole of government response to bear on the Boko Haram problem, the intelligence community has brought a whole of intelligence community response, incorporating, incorporating all 16 agencies. To add to Ambassador Merzina's cats analogy, he's herding a herd of cats and I'm herding a herd of mini cats, kittens perhaps, <laughs> um, that are sometimes even less responsive. <laughs> NGA contributes geospatial insights, FBI works to protect the homeland, Treasury works on sanctions and terrorist finance, just to name a few of what, what's happening in the intelligence community on the intelligence community side of this whole, uh, whole of government effort. Um, this, this, this effort parallels the USG pressure on the Nigerians for their own whole of government effort and, and the Nigerian whole of intelligence community effort. And we cannot ask the Nigerians to do what we do not do ourselves. We're asking the Nigerians to do a whole government effort. We, in turn, have to do a whole government effort. And it's not successful unless we do. The dangerous crisis in the Lake Chad region is a hybrid of terrorism, insurgency, political anger at the poor government services, economic devastation, and it de demands a hybrid and adaptive response from all US and all intelligence agencies involved in the fight. As we look forward, we see this dynamic replicating across Africa. I know it was mentioned in some of the earlier panels and discussions in Mali and Somalia. Mali in particular is a very concerning, um, I think, duplication of a lot of the uh, issues that we see on the ground in the Lake Chad region. Um, and complicated problems demand complicated responses. And this is the lesson I think we can take forward from the MNJTF response. It's adaptive, doesn't always solve all those issues, but it but it, it is distinguished by all of the partners, certainly on the US side, leaning forward to solve these problems, leaning forward to find solutions, and leaning forward to work with all of the other agencies involved in the effort. So with that, I think we can move to our question and answer period, but thank you very much to our hosts as well um, for inviting us all and me here today. Well, I lost my stool. Um, hold on, okay. Hello. <laughs> um, so I think you would agree this is better than an afternoon nap. Um, thank you. And um, much better. And um, I want to thank you, uh, thank the panel um, for a great uh, stab at talking about Boko Haram um, and for giving us a little humor. Um, you know, these are, these are really hard issues that we deal with and the images that we live with and sleep with are pretty difficult. And so being able to laugh with each other and at each other um, is something really, really important. So I want to thank you for that as well. Uh, let's open it up to questions. Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for such thought-provoking interactions. I'm Daphne Titus with the Department of State. I would like the panel to share its views about why Boko Haram has been, Boko Haram activity has in large part been restricted to certain regions in Nigeria as opposed to, for example, Al-Shabaab, which seems to be much more mobile in their operation area. Well, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's a great question, Daphne. Um, I think, and I, you know, certainly defer to other uh, views from our panelists here. But in Nigeria, um, Boko Haram is rooted in in a mix of all the different issues that the panelists um, described earlier. But it's also rooted in an ethnic approach. Um, and uh, I think when you look at Boko Haram itself, it is a largely Kanuri organization. They have successfully managed to 
bring in other ethnic groups and reach across other ethnic areas, but that remains the heart um, of Boko Haram itself. I think that's one reason why ISIS West Africa is a bit concerning because they're explicitly trying to work away from that. Um, so that's one, one reason we keep an eye on ISIS West Africa in particular. Um, but it's also worth that for not forgetting that, you know, I mean, Nigeria is facing a lot of other active conflicts across the whole of the country. You have the middle belt conflicts between um, herdsmen and farmers. You have the issues in the N N uh, Niger Delta in the south. Um, and those are all actually very active conflicts as well that in some ways replicate the same issues that caused Boko Haram. They're just expressed in other different ways. So I think it, we are seeing it in other parts of Nigeria. It's just not in the Boko Haram name or in the Boko Haram structure, but in, in different groups, banded groups, um, Fulani herdsmen and Niger Delta um, militant groups, but open to other. Oh, I really agree with Alexis's comments, and I don't think we should take it as a given that Boko Haram, meaning Boko Haram and ISIS West Africa, will just content themselves to sit in the Northeast indefinitely, because we've seen them already uh, strike in 2011 as far away as Abuja, and we certainly know that ISIS West Africa uh, would like very much to reach well beyond the Northeast and to hit Western targets. I'll just riff off that just to say I think the, the ISIS West Africa threat is, is the one that I think we all are convinced is the longer term strategic threat and the, the, per the governance issue that I flagged earlier, their approach clearly is one of, of recreating an alternate governance system. They are active in trying to provide humanitarian assistance. They are, you know, you know distributing justice, uh, whether you agree with their model or not. Uh, in places where it doesn't exist. So uh, there's a lot to contend with there. And uh, if you put yourself in the shoes of somebody uh, in some of these areas, uh, some of what they offer uh, looks pretty convincing. Hi there, Morgan Kay with Motive International, previously with AFRICOM and the State Department. Um, I, I'm wondering, since everyone's established such a great tone of candor, if you can maybe comment on something. Um, when I was at AFRICOM, it was in the early days of, of the African partners in, in the Lake Chad area identifying the MNJTF as their preferred you know, vehicle. And the U.S. across the interagency was extremely slow and reluctant to sort of buy into that, right? It, there was no there there was a comment that was said a lot. But eventually we did, and I think we're, we're probably pleased that we did decide to support the MNJTF. So I'm wondering, from each of your perspectives, if you can maybe identify something that changed within the interagency or within the external landscape that made the, you know, the whole of government sort of key in to the MNJTF. But the reason I ask that is, is, Chris, to your point, that I agree that it's so critical that there be regional civilian uh, organizations that we also, you know, invest in, and I'm, I, I've seen, you know, consistently the same sort of delay and reluctance to, to buy into organizations, whether it be the Lake Chad Basin Commission, which has actually five people now, um, or you know, or ECOWAS, you know, spinoff organizations, or Emirates that you know that are subnational and that are you know traditional and religious governance based. So you know, maybe sort of a lessons learned: what made us change our minds about MNJTF, and how can we maybe replicate that? to get whole of government support for, for regional civilian agencies and institutions? I think that, uh, you know, everybody was faced with the challenge of giving them too much support too fast. Uh, so as I mentioned, the MNJTF was one person when I went down there. And by my way of thinking, it's not a good idea to give that one person a massive communication and logistic support structure from outside to help them. So I think the thing that changed over time was just the capacity building that was building up in the MNJTF when they actually got a sufficient enough organization to make a difference. And that's one of the, the challenges you have with supporting or doing it for them. And uh, I think that uh, you know to stay on the right side of that is a much better place to stay. So I, I don't, I think that the interagency was not slow to support the JTF. I think the MNJTF was slow to be able to be supported. And I think that uh, that is always one of the tensions that are out there because, like I said, we could have put the thing together in a week, and uh, but it wouldn't have been 
the right thing to do, nor would it would have helped them as much as they did. And you know, we, we and I think somebody talked about patience and everything. We just have to have sufficient patience to allow them to to do it their way to to a certain point in time. Thank you. I would uh, compliment uh, the good general by noting that M and JTF evolved. If you go back to February, March 2015, and you read their concept of operations, uh, it's it's actually a mini NATO, and and, and you know I know th th that ain't never going to happen. It will take decades to do that, and they very wisely, the Africans very wisely left that uh, conops on the shelf. And they've come up with something much more practical and, and impactful. Uh, they've created a venue for operational planning and uh, coordination and a venue for sharing intelligence. It's far from perfect, but it actually uh, more or less works. It could work better, but it, it works as, as far as it goes. Uh, in terms of the civilian side, I, I don't have great faith that that is uh, ever going to happen. We've been pushing on that, asking about it, and uh, it, they know it's important to us, but the question is, is it important to them? And the fact that they haven't quite figured out how to fill slots two and a half years later answers that question. So I think uh, on the civilian side, we're, we're going to have to engage uh, bilaterally as we are and we have to pick up an issue that Chris put out there most helpfully is promoting sub-regional dialogue and we saw that at work in Berlin where you had three governors interacting wow that was rich we also saw it at USIP here uh, last year where uh, there was a conference of northern governors all brought together and you had that same uh, kind of sub-regional dialogue. So I, th I think that's where the civilian side is going to get pushed, and maybe not so much in M and JTF. Should I riff on the last part? I'll try, and try not to get fired. Um, so from certainly from AIDS programming that we have control of, we're committed to that approach with a multi-country regional approach and using and building capacity with regional institutions. Uh, G5 Sahel came up with AFRICOM. We're going to do some capacity building for them as well. Uh, we're doing uh, right now a sort of mosaic approach on national CVE strategies with a deliberate intention of having those come together uh, at some intersection here, uh, hopefully in the near future, uh, amongst the four in the Lake Chad region. Um, the, the, I think one of my worst nightmares is catastrophic success. Um, because that civilian architecture isn't in place, and if thousands and thousands and thousands of people started showing up, that starts a clock of expectations. And when those expectations aren't met, the grievances swirl around and grow exponentially. And uh, so that, that's the thing I worry about. Right now, we're, we're, we're a little bit sort of warming up, but we haven't seen the big, big flows. And thank God, because I don't think we're ready for it, <laughs> either on the international perspective, and I don't think that the Lake Chad region countries are either. Um, that might be, uh, if, I, if I'm in a bad mood, maybe I, I think that's the only way that that civilian equivalent will happen is because of the pressure of it actually happening real time. And uh, even though we, we may want to see that architecture established far in advance, maybe we won't get that. Uh, but certainly plan A should be trying to build that civilian multi-country equivalent uh, in advance. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. The only point I would add, I think, is that this is a really important question because this is a dynamic we actually see replicated across Africa, probably the whole world, but I don't know about the rest of the world, where the Western world, the US and, and Europe, are often reluctant to engage in these um, sort of binational and regional organizations because there is a lot of doubt about their capacity. And it's because we've been burned in the past when we've, we, when we've engaged with these organizations. 
But what really makes the difference is when you actually do have some African partner buy-in into the organization. And I think di discerning when you don't have partner buy-in and when you do is actually a really difficult question, much more difficult than it, than it sounds. And, it, and it's something to keep an eye on as we look to other conflicts uh, across the continent. We've talked a little bit about the G5 Sahel. That's absolutely the same dynamic where I think there is some reluctance on the part of Western partners to engage more deeply because we have doubts about capacity, probably rightful doubts. Um, but that is a, an effort that seems to have some real African partner buy-in and is probably worth in examining more closely and, and as we are doing, as the other panelists have mentioned. So I think it's a, it's a great question and a great issue to keep in mind when you look forward at, at these types of issues across the continent. Nobody knows? No Western education? I thought it was no girls' education, but no Western education. We'll take that. See, I took that more as a philosophical question. I know. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, what is Boko you and I have really a problem mean? communicating. What no, just kidding. Um, Actually, Boko Haram is a pejorative uh, that, that uh, Nigerians and others use to call the organization. They never call themselves Boko Haram. They have their own type. Well, you learn something new every day, and I certainly learned a lot during this panel. Um, I want, if there are no more questions, um, I think, any more questions? Uh, I wanted to give one more round of applause to a great panel. Thank you so much. And hey, we're gonna take about a 15-minute uh, break. And let's uh, reconvene at uh, 15 after. Thank you.